Hello, I'm Graham Irwin from Essential Habitat Architecture, and you're watching Passive Paths. I was the first passive house designer trained in California, one of the first in the United States in 2008. And since then, I've just been working to build uh, uptake and, and adoption. And I'm happy to be here today to show this house because I think at the end of the day, that's what this is about. Great living spaces for people. This was a retrofit of a, a 1950s home and they came to me looking for Passive House, or at least curious about Passive House. And I led them through our approach and, I, and had them connect with some previous clients so they could visit houses that we had done already. And they were all on board for it. Um, it was about 500 square feet smaller than it is right now. Um, we, we took the original design, the, the whole neighborhood is actually these 1950s tract homes that, that have this kind of asymmetrical gable. And we took that as a design cue, but expanded the house and elevated the indoor and outdoor experience of the home. So the, the house that was here before was really chopped up and dark and noisy and uncomfortable. There was literally no glazing open to the backyard at all. To get to the backyard, you had to go through a bedroom and out a side door. So it was just really cut off from the outside. And in California, we really celebrate indoor-outdoor connection. And this was the antithesis of that. We wanted to keep as much of outdoor space as we could but we expanded to the sides as far as we could on both, both sides. The original form of the home kind of had these notches on both sides that we filled in. We filled in one on the wing of the house behind me to create the primary suite. And on this side of the house, there was this flimsy sun porch kind of in the upper, the front third of the house. And we took that down and replaced it with a full depth addition to give us, it's about 1,800 square feet right now, three bedroom, two and a half bath. In Passive House, you, the design really affects not only the performance of the home when you're finished, but how difficult it is to get the home to meet the, the fixed level of performance that Passive House lays out. Um, and one of those key aspects is I prefer, I prefer not to use the word, the term simple, but an elemental form. So you try to keep the form fairly compact. You don't have a lot of bump outs and jogs. And the other thing we see is that um, with passive house doors and windows, because the glass is so efficient, the, you get higher performance having bigger, fewer, larger panes of glass rather than more numerous, smaller ones. And, and the, you know, it's triple pane, so the hardware is really good. And, the, you know, we'll, we'll see like these giant sliding doors that glide open and close. So I really try to leverage that too for some drama and daylighting is, is consolidate the glazing, but put it in, put it to dramatic effect. So we, we took the asymmetrical gable form of the original tract home that was here expanded the house and raised the roof line. And we arranged this, designed this so that the peak of the roof is along what I call the spine of this house. So the, the circulation of this house is actually uh, occupied, right? Dining, kitchen, home office. We don't really have hallways, but our circulation is usable and it divides the house into two wings. This wing on this side is the primary bedroom suite and, and in front of me, there are two other bedrooms that share a Jack and Jill bathroom, and there's a half bath there, and then a living room on this side. The, the client was really keen, and is really keen on, on leveraging solar to eliminate utility bills. They, actually, the house was finished, and he didn't add the solar for a year because he wanted to know exactly what the utility use would be so he could zero it out. Um, 
The house has an eight kilowatt PV system, which is a fairly standard size. And there's actually much more room on the roof if, if he wanted more solar, but that's already zeroing all the energy use of the house and the car charging. So there's not really much point in, in expanding beyond that. There is unfortunately a perspective out there that passive house is a very expensive approach. This house, it was about between 10 and 15% more than doing a code minimum building. But one, it's hard to put a price on how comfortable and quiet and healthy this home is, but they're also the clients are not paying any power bills at all. Their solar system is not only powering the entire home, which is all electric, but also charging their two electric vehicles. So they're living a, a, an energy bill free lifestyle. And that didn't used to be a big deal in California, but I can speaking from personal experience, utility bills have gotten crazy and, and these folks are in an enviable financial position. So, to get super geeky, the, the way this house performs, this really is the home of the future. But he's got all kinds of monitors in here and on the screen you can see particulates, CO2, temperature and humidity being continuously monitored and it's all just staying in range. And so we've, we've also, in addition to all this indoor monitoring, we've also got utility use monitoring and the Results are amazing. Like ac across the year, the energy demand is almost flat. There's almost no seasonal change whatsoever, which is like a dream come true for grid operators. So, you know, with my wonderful geeky client who's monitoring this and like arbitraging his solar day and night to, to maximize his return, um, you can have all this kind of monitoring in a standard home, but you, you might know what's going on, but you have no ability to, to make any choices. You have to run your heating when it's cold outside. You have to run your cooling when it's hot outside. This, this empowers you to take the data that you're getting and, and have options and influence. Um, this house was designed to be inherently comfortable. The, the house basically just stays really comfortable, even if you open the door. It doesn't take hours to come back. They, they rarely even run the heating or cooling in this house. Most of the year, it's just doing its thing with, with the HRV. So we organized the mechanicals within the conditioned space, but tried not to consume any of the floor area. The HRV heat recovery ventilator is located up above this closet. There's a, an access panel that you move to change the filters and the ducting and so forth runs along in, in this utility chase above these cabinets. We generally use heat recovery ventilators more than energy or enthalpy recovery ventilators in this climate because we, the moisture exchange is not beneficial for us. We're, it's a generally a fairly dry climate, so we're trying to shed moisture from the interior, not retain it. In, in more extreme climates, like in very cold climates where it's really dry outside, or really hot, super hot dry climates, the ERV would be more useful for us. But here we find HRVs are the, are the way to go. This is an induction range, so all electric, but not not your grandmother's electric. I have an induction cooktop in my house as well, and I would never go back to gas. This is just way better for cooking and way better for your health. Before we remodeled this house, there was a blank wall on the back of this. You couldn't even see the backyard. Now we've got these giant lift and slide doors that bring in lots of light. And I just love the hardware is so good that that's just gliding what must be a thousand pounds. Watch out, kitty. Outdoor noise is gone. There used to be really loud traffic noise from the street sometimes, that's gone as well. Like I tell people, clients of mine that don't know Passive House, we choose quiet refrigerators for these houses because of how quiet, how you know, all the other noise has gone away. So that, 
that becomes a factor, which is a nice problem to have, I think. So the centerpiece of the living room is an ethanol fireplace, bioethanol fireplace. This is unvented, um, but because, the, because it's burning alcohol, all that comes off of it is water vapor and carbon dioxide. There are no harmful fumes like with gas. And the, the ventilation system takes care of moving any of that carbon dioxide out of the space. The other thing that's good about these in Passive House, um, these don't have the same heat output as, say, a natural gas fireplace would, but the heat output is more in scale with the heating demand of these kind of homes. You have a big natural gas fireplace in a house like this, you'd end up so hot you'd have to open all the doors and windows to use it and not be in a sauna. So this house is oriented perfectly wrong. It faces east and west, and this is the west side of the house. So a big, actually a big part of the design, uh, my optimization of this for Passive House was making sure that it had good shading. So this arbor serves to shade the west side from the sun and keep the, keep the cooling demand and the overheating at a minimum. And it's, it's really comfortable. It's also a really nice place to, to be even in the middle of the summer when, the, when there's shade here it becomes much more comfortable. So this house is, was originally framed with two by four walls and the, the additional walls were framed the same way. And then there's a surplus poly ISO insulation on the outside with a rain screen beyond that. Basically, fairly typical passive house approach. The roof is an unvented roof um, and we have a truss with a cord, a uh, parallel cord that we use for nailing um, the insulation. It's, got, it's basically got dense packed cellulose up against the roof sheathing and then some more surplus poly iso on the roof on top. This is the primary bedroom. So again, we were you know, trying to accommodate these mechanicals and more importantly, making sure that we had easy access but didn't eat up all of that useful space on the other side. So we, we did a, a well-sealed door here for this door that's very rarely even opened, but that's where the heating, heat, heat pump, heating and cooling system for the house is in here. One thing we did with this design was eliminate the interior door to the garage um, for air quality reasons, and possible air quality reasons, and also to free up more of that space for closets and storage. So we're under the front entry it's rain sheltered and we've got a door. It, it also gets rid of another passive house door in the envelope. So we eliminated another opening. So this is the garage with the two EVs. Also on this wall over here are Tesla power walls that they use for storing power for the house. So we have two mobile Teslas, but we also have two Tesla power walls here that store energy to power this home. And each one of these is 13.5 kilowatts. And the owner got two of them because they can literally power their house with business as usual, even when the grid goes out. They don't have to think about, oh, there's a grid shortage. We have to not cook or turn off these things. They literally live the same way when there's power from the grid or when there isn't. These can be charged both from the grid or from the solar system. And I think he, he, the owner mentioned to me today that he started charging at night from the grid because during the day his solar output is worth more. It's more valuable to sell that back to the grid than to use it to charge the batteries. So he's big into, into this arbitrage thing and this house enables him to do that. So um, thanks for coming to visit the project with us. This is a, you know, a fairly modest project, but it's a really solid, comfortable, healthy home with lots of space, feels great inside, um, and, and lets the owners live without utility bills. <laughs>